Hello, um, I'm Chris Jackson. I'm the uh, editor in chief and publisher of One World um, Books, uh, publisher here in New York. Uh, and thank you so much for coming tonight for our um, Ideas and Action event this evening, which will be our fifth Ideas and Action event um, in the series that we've been doing. So before we start, um, as we typically do, I'd like to just take a quick moment to uh, to um, uh, just uh, take a moment of silence to sort of observe, I think, the, uh, both the, the, all those who we've lost to this um, uh, pandemic, but also all those we've lost to police violence over the last uh, several years um, and that we're protesting in the streets about today. And I just want to take a moment to observe that and hope you'll join me for that. And now I'd like to uh, uh, introduce, um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, all the people who've helped us put this together tonight, including the fine people at Penguin Random House and at Robin Hood, who is our co-sponsor tonight. That's New York City's largest poverty fighting organization. In the past 30 years, they've partnered with over 250 nonprofits to support food, housing, education, legal services, and workforce development to New Yorkers living in poverty. And more recently, their COVID relief fund has provided emergency support through food, housing, job security uh, to New Yorkers across all five boroughs. And um, tonight, uh, our guest is Wes Moore, who is um, the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, and more importantly for our purposes tonight, the author of Five Days, a becoming book from, um, from One World Publishers. I'd like to welcome, welcome Wes. What's going on? <laughs> Not much, really good <laughs> to see you. We've had little technical difficulties. Uh, today, which is throwing things, but things are going to be smooth sailing. Things are, things are going to be good. Things are going to be good from now on. From this it's, good to, it's good to see you. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, yeah. really excellent to have you here, Wes. We've, um, we've worked together on a few books now. Uh, right. The first book, The Other Wes Moore, um, classic uh, that we did together when you were just a dewy-eyed young man. Um, <laughs> and we did the work. <laughs> um, another great book that kind of took us through a little bit more of your life story um, and the stories of some other people who are doing important work around the country and around the world. Um, and now Five Days, which is a book that takes us back to your hometown of Baltimore. And I think in a lot of ways is a really vital book, I think, for this moment. Um, you know, in our Ideas in Action series so far, we've talked to a number of authors, ta Coates, Ibram Kendi, uh, Dr. Mona Hanna-Atisha, uh, Carla Bilvencencio, and last week, Alicia Garza, all of whom have been trying to help, I think, all of us grapple with this moment we're in with COVID first and now with uh, a protest movement that feels really pivotal, um, perhaps even in like the history of our country um, and the direction we go in. Your book, in some ways, I think, is the one that is most appropriate to the moment because it takes us back five years to a very similar set of uh, circumstances and a similar set of responses. Can you just first of all tell us what are the five days that your book is about? Yeah, yeah, and um, and and first I just want to uh, just start say uh, good evening everybody and and uh, and just thank you to Chris. Um, you know, Chris is right. I've you know I've I've known Chris been rocking with Chris for like fifteen years now, uh, wow. and and everything uh, everything that I ever put out, everything that I've ever released um, has been under the guided eye. Of Chris Jackson, and um, and I have to tell you, um, you know, in addition to being a, a friend, he is a remarkable editor. We, if you just think about the names that he just laid out, right? All people who are literally helping to lead us through this moment: um, Alicia Garza, Abram Kendi, Tana Hesse, Brian Stevenson. Um, that's all Chris Jackson, and I, and I think it's important for people to take a pause and recognize that that uh, that for every single book that you see, for every author that's put out. Um, Chris has helped guide us, every single one of us, through our process, through our writing, through the writer's block, through the ebbs and flows, through the I don't see how this thing is going to pull off. Um, Chris has been the light behind all those books that everyone is reading and that is helping people dissect this moment. Um, and so I just think I, I just wanted to pause and just honor you, Chris, because uh, your contribution to not just uh, this movement, but your contribution to all of our lives individually um, can't be can't be overstated. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, True. 
I wish I turned off the video while you were saying that because now I'm... <laughs> I'll, I'll say I'll say it again if you need me to. Say it I'll no say more. It again. <laughs> Let's move on. So, but uh, but no, but and and I and I appreciate I I, I appreciate the the framing of it because. I think that's absolutely right, where I feel like this story not only serves as a bit of a precursor and a bit of a warning that people did not take heed to, um, it's very much reliving history when we saw how this thing continued to unfold. Um, and, and it's reliving history on a, on a few different levels. And I think actually this moment leads to a lot of important lessons learned that I think people need to pay attention to. Um, you know, the first was that the, the story of Freddie Gray, and just to add context to, you know, for if everyone, anyone is wondering about the story of Freddie Gray and, or, or what exactly happened at that moment, this is a 25-year-old young man who, made, who, who did the crime of making eye contact with police. That's why he was chased, because he made eye contact. He ran, he was caught and arrested, um, and an hour after he was arrested, he was in a coma. A week after he was placed in a coma, he died. And this led to weeks of protests that took place in Baltimore, all peaceful protests and people demanding transparency and justice and accountability. And then on the evening, on, on, on the Monday evening, actually the evening of when he was laid to rest, uh, was when you really saw the Baltimore, uh, the Baltimore uprising. And that's when that evening the National Guard was called in. That's when that evening the, the military forces came in. Um, but I think there's a couple really important points that you, you, you allude to, Chris, that I think are important to understand the dynamic of what we're talking about. Right? Um, one is, in many ways, Freddie was, Freddy was more of a larger spark that set something off, but that was very known and common to many people in Baltimore. Because the reality is, if you just look at the two years before Freddie Gray, in Baltimore alone, there was Anthony Anderson, there was Chris Brown, there was Tyrone West. In fact, one of the people who, uh, who, uh, who I profile um, inside of the book um, is Tyrone West's sister, who every single Wednesday, she holds something called West Wednesday. And where she goes out and she protests the fact that there has been no accountability, no police accountability for the murder of her brother. And so when Freddie Gray happened, it was really more of like a, there was, there was this spark that lit off in Baltimore. And part of it was because it was coming off the heels of everything else that was happening. It came literally right off the heels of Michael Brown. It came right off the heels of the launch of this movement called Black Lives Matter, where it went from initially being in this hashtag to now being a true global movement where you can move and mobilize quickly. And so Freddie Gray, that happened really as, as Black Lives Matter was really hitting a stride that wasn't necessarily there with Anthony Anderson, Tyrone West, et cetera. The other thing that, um, that I think is important to recognize about this moment and, and why in many ways it differs from the moment we're seeing right now is that the bar has been raised in terms of how we define progress, right? So, so when, when we had the uprising in Baltimore, um, people think that the thing that kind of calmed people down was the fact that the National Guard was brought in. That's not true. You know, bringing in military forces generally ha doesn't have a tendency to calm things down, right? And so when the National Guard came in, actually the Saturday after the uprising was supposed to be the largest protest that Baltimore had seen thus far. And that was the one everyone was like, this is going to be the big one. And it didn't happen. The reason it didn't happen wasn't because the National Guard got brought in. The reason it didn't happen was because Baltimore City State's Attorney, Marilyn Mosby, the Friday before, pressed charges against the six officers. And I mean, I, I, I won't forget it, Chris, it was almost like a celebratory feeling in Baltimore, where people were like, wait a second, you mean they were charged for that? 
because that wasn't the expectation. The, the expectation and what people had seen in precedent with all these other cases that came before was the general idea was people heard about it, there was a payout, and it went away, and no one was then charged for the crime. And she charged them. And that had a way of bringing the temperature down because in many ways, people in Baltimore at that point were like, I cannot believe it. We actually might see justice for what happened to Freddie. And you look at also then months after, there was this consent decree that the Department of Justice put out. And the consent decree, just like we've seen in other cities such as Ferguson, which was laying out a pattern and practice of systemic violence and systemic and appropriate behavior that the police department were doing particularly to black communities. Now you fast forward, and this is what I mean by the bar being risen. You fast forward, uh, two of the officers were found now guilty, charges were dropped in the other four. And once a new administration came on board, the consent decree was rolled back. And so I think the bar has now been risen that, you know what, charges are not enough. We want convictions. Consent decrees are not enough because that can just get rolled back depending on who's in charge and who's in power. You need laws changed. You need structural change. Right. And so that's where I think that the, you see how the difference between what happened and also where the case of Freddie Gray in Baltimore really was an important and serves as an important example and model for how people are looking at what's taking place right now. Yeah, you know, when I think about the book and I think about what's happening now, and it's been actually really useful to have the book in my mind as I think about what's unfolding right now, um, I see it both as like a model and that can kind of help us see, I think, the different stages that these things can take, but also a cautionary tale about, um, I would say, some of the, the failures of the movement that arose um, during those five days. Uh, and maybe there are lessons in that for how you can make change in a different way. Um, and I think, you're, I think you make a really excellent point that it was a different time and every time we come back to these things, and you know, it's funny, when we were talking to Alicia last week, she talked about history being not like a circle, but a spiral, right? Where you get closer and closer and closer to the core of the thing. And I think maybe this time we're getting a little closer to the core of the thing, as you said, than we did in Baltimore, where we, you know, to some degree, uh, end it without getting right to the heart of the matter. Um, but I wanted, I think one way into this conversation could be thinking about how, the way you structured the book, which was through the lives of eight different people over these five days, which I think is a really smart way to tell the story because we got to see the story at every strata, really, of Baltimore society from, you know, a kid who kind of found himself, you know, like in the protest to, uh, um, you know, a sister who was, who'd been protesting, as you said, for years over her own brother's death to, you know, wealthy people in the city, to activists, to the police, which I think is also a really interesting layer of the book, yeah. telling part of the story from the perspective of a uh, black police officer in Baltimore at the time, yeah. um, which I think is also somewhat enlightening for what we see happening today. Um, and particularly as the movement today becomes more and more focused on police behavior, not only in uh, the violence that they've enacted on black communities, but in their reaction to these protests. Um, and I think it's, been, it's really interesting to see a protest as it escalates from the perspective of the police officer um, and uh, who himself feels besieged, not just by the protesters, but by the police department um, that put him on that front line. Yeah. Um, so I thought maybe we could just talk about each of these characters just for a moment and, and really like what we kind of get out of those characters and kind of what the lessons are, not the lessons, but what some of the resonances are with what's happening right now. So uh, you mentioned um, Tawanda Jones, who actually is the character that we start the book with. Um, and Tawanda is the character you mentioned, who, or the woman, it's not a character, um, who uh, lost her brother to police violence and who protested day after day after day, trying to get justice before the movement took off um, and did it in complete isolation and alone. And I think for me, one of the most vivid sort of images that kind of stuck in my mind, each one of these characters, there's something that just like burned into my memory, right? Mm -hmm. For me, it was, you know, the two images for Tawanda. One is her standing by herself 
with her protest sign, like sometimes with others coming, sometimes completely alone, yeah. but steadfast looking for justice for her brother. And then the second is when she's able to join this larger movement after Freddie Gray's death and she's marching, there's a moment when she's walking along and she's just excited to be in this crowd of people who are finally gonna be able to take their case to City Hall to try to get justice, not just for her, you know, for Freddie Gray, but for all the young men who she mentioned in Baltimore who'd been killed. Yeah. Um, and there's a moment when she sees the protests go left. She sees someone grabbing a garbage can. You know, some of the protesters try to stop the person, but he throws it um, and, and things start to escalate from there. Um, when you think about Twanda, um, and her kind of quest for justice. Do you think that the movement that formed in Baltimore brought her closer to, to justice? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, and, and, and first, you know, you're, you're, you're right, because I remember, and again, I give a lot of credit to, to, to you, Chris, where, you know, and I remember thinking about with, uh, with, with you know, Erica, you know, Erica Green's- at, at And we should just take a quick moment just to, just to emphasize that. Erica Green, the collaborator on the book, Yes. Uh, incredible reporter, um, works with the New York Times now, um, and has been doing incredible work in education, um, but was in Baltimore covering the uprising as a That's reporter right. for the Baltimore Sun. But That's right. And, and, and a, a, a great friend and a great reporter. Um, and, you know, I remember the, the, some of the initial conversations about it was like, you know, okay, but how exactly do you structure and tell all these various stories? Uh, and I remember one of the, one of the things that uh, really stuck with you know, you actually uh, uh, directed us to book Nine Lives uh, about New Orleans and, um, and, and how exactly to tell these very disparate stories, but tell it in a way that you really have these crash moments on these individual days, despite these being people who otherwise have no reason to be in the same spaces in the same areas. Um, Tawanda was fascinating to me and, you know, and, I, and I've known and respected her commitment to this for years. And she was, she was having this very, um, you know, this moment where she was proud of the fact that Baltimore was like finally standing up. Baltimore was finally saying, okay, we get it. And we're marching the streets, despite the fact that like you said, for over a year before, she literally would be there every Wednesday and she still does it to this day. Every Wednesday, sometimes by herself in snow, sleet, a hundred degree weather, demanding justice for her brother. And so she was proud of the fact that the city was really standing up. Um, she was also though, had this feeling of, where was this when my brother was killed? You know, where was this when my brother was laying in the middle of the street with mace on his, with mace all over him and boot marks on him. And I had to go and identify his body at the morgue. And there was this moment, there was this, this Saturday uh, that we actually start the book in. Uh, on, on a Saturday. And it was interesting because in some ways the book is actually bookended by baseball. That, that day they were having a protest downtown while the, uh, while the Orioles were playing the Red Sox. And that was the game where they asked the crowd to stay in the stadium because there were protesters outside of the stadium. So they put on the loudspeaker, we're asking you to please stay inside the stadium because they didn't want the fans going outside while the protests were going on because they thought it was just a recipe uh, for confrontation. And so she's marching with the Gray family. Right. They asked her, they knew her story, and they're like, can you march with us? So she's literally marching downtown with the Gray family. And then you're right, there's this really important and powerful scene in the book where she notices the crowd turning in a different direction. She's like, where are they going? And the Gray family was looking around like, they, they didn't have an idea. And that's when she noticed that someone else was in charge. Someone else was directing the crowd. And that's when you see and you saw the dynamics of what was going on in terms of the protests and about who was taking control of the situation, who was directing the crowd. You know, she, and, and she tells this great story in the book where she talks about how she always knew where to protest to get attention, but not necessarily to bring trouble. Because she was like, I'm not a, in fact, there's this great quote where she says, she says, I'm not a troublemaker. I'm just trying to get justice. And so when she saw the crowd making a turn, she saw everything going downtown and she saw, to your point, the, you know, 
uh, somebody picking up a trash can and throwing it. She saw the fighting that begun after the racial epithets were thrown at the protesters from the people at the baseball game, uh, from the people outside in the, in, the, in the bars. She saw this thing going sideways really quickly. And that led to the Saturday night that we then ended up having. But watching it and hearing it through her eyes and through her perspective was really important because I think in her storytelling, and in her, in her memory and in her narrative, you kind of see how the different dynamics of the protests were playing itself out. Um, and how all the emotion were showing themselves. And she said something that was actually really interesting and that I thought, I, I thought actually was one of the more, one of the things that really grabbed me about that whole scene was when she was talking about the little kids and how they were yelling at the police officers. Yeah, no, that's a great moment. And when they were yelling at the police officers, she said they weren't yelling Freddie's name. They were yelling things that they, they were like, yo, that's for, that's for my Uncle Buck. Right. Or that's, for the, that's, for, that's how you molested my mother. Like right. it was all the frustration right. that people had towards the police force that was being spilled at that point. That she, she's like, this is much bigger than, what would, than, than people protesting justice for Freddie. Right. Which I thought was a really, really important telling of the emotion that was bottled up in the city at that point when she was just like, she was, she was talking about, look at the fearlessness in these kids' eyes. Yeah, because there's this they great, were there for a reason. There's this great moment when she's like that, when she calls it like the day the kids fought back. You yes, know? the day the kids fought back. And, um, and you do realize that it's so much bigger than even like the, I mean, it's hard to imagine a thing being bigger than one human life being destroyed, but it's about this whole pattern um, that had extended over years. And she's such a great representative of that because she was someone who um, had absorbed this enormous pain of this loss. But then that pain was of course um, exacerbated by the lack of justice, but didn't have a place to put it, you know? Sure. And that this movement gave all of these people or so many of the people in Baltimore a place to put this sort of bottled frustration um, that had been building up over time. That's right. um, and you do get a sense, and this is the thing I love about the kind of way that the narrative plays out, because it's very much immediate on the ground. You're like right over her shoulder, you know, watching these things happen. And you can see how, um, you know, in a moment, uh, there's no, um, w when things have been held back for so long, it's hard to control yeah. uh, where that goes. Um, and of course, uh, this, the whole story of those five days is about how hard it was to control um, and maybe though, and this is the thing I love about Tawanda, like maybe it shouldn't be controlled, you know, right. like maybe there's a point where um, it has to be expressed. Yes. So on, on the other side of the coin, like way on the other side, we have uh, John Angelus, who's one of the uh, characters. And when we first meet John, um, John is an executive with the Baltimore Orioles and he is um, finding out about what's happening at the stadium. Yeah. Um, and feels like he needs to speak up and respond. And so when I think about John's story, and I, I want you to tell us a little about, more about that um, in a moment, but when I think about it, I think about what's happening in some ways right now in corporate America that we're seeing, mm -hmm. board, which is among people who are kind of, you know, powerful people who are CEOs, people who have seen the problem as John did every day, right? They see the problem every day, they know it's there. John was a very politically aware person. His own father, I believe, had run for, um, political office, uh, and he had been involved in, in the legal profession. So he, he knew kind of what the deal was in terms of wealth inequality and the disparities in, in uh, criminal justice. Um, but it's the kind of thing that you can both know. You know, Michelle Alexander had this great line in her, in her op-ed on, on Sunday in the New York Times where she said, she talks about a state where we can both know a thing and not know the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We see it every day, but we can't allow ourselves to actually see it. But he came to a moment where he had to see it. And once you see it, you realize we should have done something about this yeah. a long, long time ago. Once you allow yourself to see it, you regret how much time you didn't see it or you forced yeah. yourself not to see it. Anyway, so he has this reckoning, you know, which I think happens and you just hope that, you know, it has a lasting effect. But yeah. He absolutely had this moment of reckoning because his baseball game <laughs> was jeopardized. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and, and uh, to watch how uh, 
the, the day, the same day for all these different characters was fascinating. So John, right, John was on vacation at right. the time. And he starts getting texts. And John is not only like the senior vice president or head of operations for the Orioles, he's the son of the owner. So John is a guy who like came up in this, came up in privilege and that type of thing. Um, I mean, his family owns the team. Right. And, and so he gets these, he's getting these texts and he's like, usually when he started up, when he started, you know, in, on the lower rungs of the organization, now he was like the top of the organization. But when he started the lower runs, he's like, I would get updates in the game and you know, that kind of thing. But he's like, but I never got that anymore. And he's like, but as I'm on vacation, he got a text saying basically like, John, I need to give you an update. And the update was like, we might have a problem on our hands because <laughs> we got a game going on and there is like, there's action going on outside. And the police department now is getting involved because the police department technically has final jurisdiction. So John's getting all these quick updates. Finally, he gets the word that the police department made the final decision to keep the fans inside the stadium. And John is, you know, again, still on vacation with his wife up in, up in uh, uh, Saratoga Springs, New York. And he starts tweeting, he starts reading Twitter and he doesn't have, a, he didn't have a whole lot of followers or whatever, but he just, he occasionally would check Twitter just to see what people are saying about the team and whatever like that. And he does hashtag Orioles and all that kind of stuff. And there's this whole string of stuff that's all not about the game, about the protests. And he reads one tweet by a, uh, a, a journalist and a, and a, and a radio uh, DJ named Brett Hollander that tipped him off. And basically it was saying like, you know, I understand that, but you know, this is no way to solve things, violence and so on and so forth. John then decides to put out a tweet storm that goes viral where he's basically standing up for the protesters. And he's like, well, how quickly we forget the history of this country. How quickly we forget how this country was founded and how, how, how entitled it is for us not to appreciate why they're protesting and about the loss of jobs and about the fact that everything was outsourced and about how the economies change and, 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 and. And he very quickly ends up becoming like this celebrity overnight because of tweets that he pulls together. You know, one of the reasons also I was, I was fascinated by his character and his progression was he's also one of the people that he ends his vacation, comes home. Uh, and then when the Orioles are making a decision, even after everything goes down later on and the uprising and like that, he's one of the people that helps to make the final decision that the Orioles were going to play the game with no fans for the first time ever in baseball history. You had a baseball game where the official attendance was zero. And that's because Baltimore was still in the middle of a state of emergency. But it was one of these things where John, and he acknowledges it, but John had less to lose than everybody else. Right. You know, John, John, John is, you know, you know, I, I think he, he took some, he took courageous positions considering his position, but he had less to lose than the other characters, than the other individuals that, that you know, we profile and follow, right. and, you know, throughout this process. But it is interesting watching kind of the parallel that we're seeing right now with what's taking place around what happened to Mr. Floyd. Because we're watching how corporate America is like tripping over itself to say Black Lives Matter. <laughs> You know, who can put up a black screen on their Instagram fastest? And you realize that while, while we watched a level of progress in that way where, you know, listen, you know, no one, you, you couldn't get folks right. to say Black Lives Matter right. a year ago, despite the fact that, you know, the, like the fact that we had more than enough evidence that according to many people in America, they don't. You couldn't get anybody to back it, right? We also know that when you look at the crowds, I mean, I'm amazed when you look at the crowds back in Baltimore in 2015, it was a sea of us. It was a sea of black folks in right. this crowd. And now you're like picking out black folks mm -hmm. in the crowd, right? <laughs> and so you, 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 you find this thing where there is this, there's, there's this different type of dynamic that takes place. And, and in many ways, you're right where John in some ways serves as almost like this precursor of this awakening of white America about the fact that, oh, no, 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 this is, this is real. 
and they actually have found the voice to be able to step up and say something. Um, but I do think it's, it's important to watch the character arc for John as well, because it's also very emblematic of the fact that he just has less to lose. Right, right. And the things that sort of torture him within this are different than things that are torturing the people who are literally on the ground and who have suffered um, genuine and grievous losses. Yes. Um, and sometimes, as you point out in the book, um, generationally, like it's not just about something that just happened to you, you know, but generationally that suffered losses. Whereas generationally, he's been, he was the beneficiary of having been born into this, uh, into this position. So it, again, it's really fascinating because you do put us again right over his shoulder to give us that perspective, um, even as it's a perspective that offers, I think, a lot of uh, questions and, and certainly puts its intention with a lot of the rest of the story, but um, allows us to see how this unfolds from that particular uh, point of view, I think, which is really important. Um, and speaking of uh, points of view with tension in them, um, Mark Party is the third character we meet. Mark is a member of the Baltimore Police Department. Yeah. Um, and uh, a black uh, police officer who uh, we meet on his day off, <laughs> um, <laughs> being asked to return to the Inner Harbor yeah. of Baltimore to police the protest. Yeah. Um, now, the image that sticks in my mind with Mark is, and I don't want to go too deep into the book, um, Although the image that really sticks in my mind is, is, is fairly deep in the book. Yeah. Um, but you know, there, there was something that uh, Alicia said last week, Alicia Garza said last week, one of the questions to her was, you know, what do you do if one of your family members is a police officer, right? Like, how, how should I feel about that family, office, family member? And Alicia said, I thought, gave a very generous answer. She said, well, you know, a lot of times, you know, we do have family. That are, like, a lot of black people, a lot of brown people, a lot of people of conscience of any race or whatever have family members who are police officers. And a lot of those police officers, because of the way that we have over assigned the police with too many duties to do in our culture, um, mm -hmm. people grow up and they sometimes want to be a policeman or a policewoman because they want to do some good work or because they want to have a solid government job, you know, or there's a million reasons. And what happens often is that those people even if they begin with the best of intentions, um, they fall into a system that does not reward <laughs> those good intentions and in fact, incentivizes them in, a, in an entirely different direction. Um, and, you know, there's, a, you know, baseball is a, is a kind of uh, motif throughout the book. And it makes me think about like, you know, is it player or is it the game? <laughs> you know, when you have someone like Mark Partee, like, um, do you think that he was someone who, began, although he ends up, you know, in this police department that's been accused of, uh, of so many crimes um, and is forced to enforce in some questionable ways um, the, uh, the directives that he gets from, from Brass in terms of policing the protest. Do you think that he's someone who entered with good intentions or, or why did he become a police officer? Yeah. He, um... I, 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 I love Mark Partee and I, and I think he is, he's so, he's so emblematic of the conflict, uh, you know, that we see throughout this. You know, he became a police officer because he really wasn't sure what else he wanted to do. He thought he first was thinking about business and thought about education, tried, he tried uh, to get inside the classroom. And then he said, uh, you know, you realize very quickly in your first days of being a teacher, whether or not you're meant to be a teacher or not. And he said, I realize I'm not meant to be a teacher. And it was really then he was like, he wanted to give a chance to, uh, to being a police officer. And he found in being an officer that he found something he was really good at and he enjoyed it. And he rose to the ranks quickly. Um, you know, he, and yeah, I don't want I'm not gonna get too deep into the book or get too much away, but I don't know if there is anyone in the process of the five days who has a bigger arc than Mark Partey. Huh from where he started yeah. and where he ended five days later. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'll say that and, and, I, and I hope people go and, and dig in and see exactly what I mean. Um, but he was fascinating because, and I remember having conversations with, with Mark where 
he said to me, he's like, I know that none of my brothers and sisters in uniform, I know that none of them woke up that morning with homicide on their mind. I know that none of them woke up that morning saying, you know what, I'm trying to kill somebody today. And he said, but I also know that for kids coming up in West Baltimore, why they don't believe me. Because he grew up in West Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I know these kids. I know where they're coming from. I know the streets that they're coming from. And he very much considers himself and considered himself a survivor in all that. Someone who really transcends, someone who, who wanted to become an officer because he wanted to be able to show kids that there's a different path, show kids what he was able to turn into, right. show kids that, you know, look, I, I made it and I'm staying in the community and I'm working in the community. Um, and he rose quickly through the ranks of the Baltimore City Police Department. Uh, I, I think he also, though, is one of these people that, that uh, you see very early this crisis of faith that he finds himself having, um, you know, uh, where in my, there's a time when he said, uh, you know, I, I wish I could like stop time and pause and just talk to these kids and let them know, like, why are you doing this? Guys, this is not what you should be doing. This is not what you should be doing. But then he also says, but then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, why not? Like, why shouldn't they? Right. What option do they have? And so he, he was, um, he was a really interesting person to kind of see those five days through his eyes, because I still think, and I still think to this day, um, he has a very real and clear faith and belief in the police department. He thinks there's a very clear role that the police department does play. You know, there's, um, there's a, a time in the book where he, when he's saying, he's like, you know, I just find it interesting that everybody's blaming us for all this stuff. And he's like, but well, you know what? When something happens in your neighborhood and you call the police, you want us to come quick. But he's like, but I just, but, but now everything we do, we're the bad guys, we're the enemies. So he really does, he, st he still firmly believes in the ethos of the police and the ethos of the police department in the need for a police department. Um, but I think he also is one of these people that because of his past, because of his background, because of his childhood, uh, and because of everything he has seen since, he also does, he's very clear on the conflict that then does exist even in his own mind about the fact that he is, uh, he is wearing and defending a, a uniform that for many of the kids he's, he's uh, seen every day is undefendable. And that right. sits with him. Right. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about him as a character um, was, was this kind of tension he had between the kind of work he was doing and also um, being both the, you know, the person policing those neighborhoods, but also someone who was also the kid in the neighborhood himself at one point. Um, but also, the, you know, you see really clearly the ways that the uh, department um, was uh reckless in the way that it used its officers um and uh you know in some ways exacerbated again like the conflict on the ground was was happening because of the policies of the department and i think that's one of the things that we're seeing again a lot right now that there are you know, there's a way to personalize the conflict to the individual policeman, which I think in some cases is appropriate because there are individual police officers rather who are um, racist, who are prone to violence, who are, you know, provocative to the people that they're supposed to be serving and protecting. But then there's a bigger question, which is what use have we decided, have we decided as a society to put these people to? And within those five days following party around you, the question keeps coming to you. Like, what is the job that he's being given to do? It's exactly. like, um, exactly. there are mixed messages. There are, there's, you know, equipment failures. There is communication problems. And you realize just how haphazard this system can be in a crisis. Um, and how exactly. that endangers the people who are protesting it endangers the police officers. It becomes, 
And it does make you question the, you know, even though Parti doesn't, as a reader, you start to think about like, well, what is this system that he's describing? And I think that's an important point, Chris, because it, it, it takes us away from this good apple, bad apple argument, right? It takes us away from this, well, we just need to eliminate the bad officers. Like, I'm not even sure what that means. Where, where I, am, I am not interested in having a good apple, bad apple conversation, as long as we still have systems that are fundamentally broken. And so you, and, and that's not to say, and, and I'm, I'm actually saying it with a belief that we have officer ranks full of good people. There are people who have good hearts. There are people in the force that, that, that care deeply about the community, that actually want the best for the community. This isn't about I, the identification of good apples versus bad apples. We're talking about systems here that are in place that have, that have broken, that have, that have not, not just broken bounds, but broken agreements and laws. And so how then, do we, how then do we think about that? How then do we think about ways to actually reform a system so that individual good apples, bad apples, and that, then, that, then, that, then we're actually adding weight to that as a conversation. You know, I, I think about it very similar to the, to the way that I think about race inside of this, inside of this country. Right, where, where we, we hold, we, we, we carry around this myth that racism is an individual act, right? So unless you're, you know, unless you're wearing a hood or saying the N-word that you're not racist. But we've got to dispel that because racism is a system. You know, it's a system that allows a black person with a college degree to earn less than a white high school dropout. And that is a fact, a statistical fact, right? It's a system that allows, that, that allows a, a, a black person, that allows black people to die at twice the rate from the coronavirus as white Americans. It's a system that allows, you know, that makes it 42% uh, more likely for a black woman to die of breast cancer than a white woman. This is not about an individual act, it's a system that has to be dismantled. And I think about the same way when we have a conversation about policing. This is not questioning whether or not there are good people. There are plenty of good people in every police force. This is about how do we understand a system that has not worked when it comes to actually protecting and serving our citizens equally. And the lack of accountability that then exists when you have functional breakdowns within that system. And I, and I think with, with, with Part T, you see it where Part T, and, 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 I, and I say this unequivocally, Part T is a good person. I have spent a lot of time with him. I like him. I think he has a good, good heart. I also think he was asked to lead in a system that, is, that, that was not only damaged, what was causing damage. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's again, like one of the real virtues of mm, experiencing these five days through these different rotating kind of kaleidoscopic perspectives is that you get, and particularly with party, I feel is you, you see someone who's actually trying, you can act, see precisely where, how the system is broken because you see someone trying to work within it in a way that would imply that the system works and you can yeah. see how it just is not possible. He keeps running into walls instead of it being like a system that's actually leading him to doing like helpful, useful um, and just things. Uh, he has to sort of fight against the system to achieve that. Okay, let's move on to another character, Greg Butler, another one of my favorite characters, yes. an iconic character from the uh, Five Days of Uprising. Um, so there's a, of course, the moment that's steered in my memory with Greg is the sort of his cinematic moment um, <laughs> that was on the cover of newspapers around the country. Greg was a young man who was somewhat aimless, I would say, at the beginning of this, um, who uh, hadn't quite found his footing in life, I'll say. Um, <clears throat> and so I won't go to the cinematic moment. <clears throat> I'll go to another moment, though, where 
he is standing, you know, at this sort of raised area of the city. Mm. And he looks down into the city and he sees smoke rising. And he says to himself, that's where I have to be and goes toward the smoke. Um, and the smoke being burning buildings in uh, West Baltimore, I believe at the time. Yeah. Um, what do you think drew someone like Greg, like why did he want to run to the smoke? Greg, uh, Greg is the perfect definition of disillusionment. And, um, you know, Greg, Greg is, is this personification of this, of this larger dilemma that I think people have when it comes to young black men, particularly young black men who are coming up in complicated circumstances. Um, where there's this idea that if we can do this thing for them, for them, that everything is going to be okay. Uh, I'm not going to give it away for everybody, but to say Greg's childhood was, was complex is an understatement. And to say that the fact that Greg is standing there at that moment on that hill, looking at the smoke, going down to the smoke is a miracle. Um, and when you when you see Greg's background, you'll you'll understand exactly why. Because Greg has cheated death a few times, um, in really pretty amazing ways. And but Greg is also someone who was a, I mean a legitimate basketball star, was one of the top people in the city in basketball. Uh, got himself where a college was actually wanted to pay for him to go there, and 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 you know everyone thought that Greg was on his way. I mean Greg was the one getting featured in the Baltimore Sun and because of his, because of his athletics. And because of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a slip up with the school system that people will see in, in the book, it had nothing to do with him. A mess up on, on that adults did, that a system did. He ends up losing his scholarship, unable to pay his college bill, and now basically frustrated with the world because you know, there's this idea that, that somehow the work is done when someone goes to a school or gets a job. It's like, okay, society did their best and right, right. that's the best they can do. And, and Greg really personifies the fact that as hard as he worked and as hard as he tried, that day, that Monday, he is still there working odd jobs, looking down at fire and saying, that's where I've got to go. Because I feel that in so many ways, at every different turn, the world disappointed him. The world failed him. And so when he's down there, uh, you know, in that iconic moment, uh, and looking around and wondering how was he going to respond to this? How is he going to respond to this moment? Right. Mm -hmm. His response was, I'm going to help burn this thing down. Right. I'm going to help burn this thing down. Right. And, uh, you know, it goes back to that, uh, to this, uh, the powerful, uh, you know, Nigerian proverb that says, you know, a child that is not embraced by the village will burn the village to feel the fire's warmth. Right. And when Greg sees what's going on in Baltimore, when Greg sees his home, his hometown uh, in this state, in this place, and Greg has a choice about how he's going to respond. Do nothing, help solve it, or another option. You, I wanted to take the reader on a journey to understand why he chose the option he did. So let there be no question. Let there be a clear understanding of where Greg was in that moment. Uh, and you get a better understanding of why he does what he does and chooses to do what he does. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think is so interesting about Greg in juxtaposition to some of the other characters is that you have like, for instance, John Angelos, who we talked about earlier, who deliberates a lot because he's like, well, what do I, what is the best thing to do in this situation? Do I have a game with nobody there? Do I not have a game? Do I say something? Do I not say something? The flip side is Greg at that moment of decision, hmm. there's no deliberation. He no becomes it's this, it's this amazing kind of cathartic, fully alive moment yes. of pure action where he's yes. like, 
this is where everything led. That's right. And he takes a decisive and, but you know, later questioned and questionable act that he commits, um, but in the moment feels completely like the right thing to do. Like he comes alive in that moment. Um, and, and is validated by the community. Exactly. Is completely validated in that moment, which That's is right. The other thing is like, you know, I, I mean, I love the idea that they're like, Greg was the secret hero that no one knew was the hero. Right. Until the moment came and then he's the one who, who sees it and enacted. Um, okay, I have to go quickly now through a couple of more characters. We're gonna skip some. There's so many great characters, eight of them <laughs> in the book. But I just want to talk about a couple more because we don't have that much time. Yeah. Um, one is Anthony Williams, probably mm -hmm. my favorite character in the book. Me too. Me yes. Too. <laughs> Anthony is a completely lovable character. Um, yeah. And Anthony runs the Shake and Bake, which is a uh, roller skating rink yeah. in the neighborhood. And um, that is beloved. Um, by people in the neighborhood. And I first went to Shake and Bake when I was, I think, 13, 13 or 14 years old was the first time I went to Shake and Bake. Really? Yes. Shake and Bake? Yeah. <laughs> you, are you a good roller skater? <laughs> I was a horrible roller skater. But people, I mean, you had you had serious roller skaters with the Shake and Bake because, like, they seriously could do things on eight wheels that most folks couldn't do on two feet. You know what I'm saying? Like, some of those people were really good. Some people more went to Shake and Bake just to go like hang out and talk to girls. But I mean like, but Shake and Bake was the spot. Shake and Bake was the spot in West Baltimore. It was, it was I mean, and, and, and Anthony uh, was, was the consistent, you know? He was the consistent Shake and Bake. And he would bring kids in to work at Shake and Bake. Yes. Get it into a haven for like young people in the community. That's right, people, people who couldn't get a job anywhere else could get a job at Shake and Bake. You know, people who they knew whether it was my record or my tattoos or my reputation. I'm not going and no one else is hiring me. But I knew I could go to Mr. Ant. I knew I was gonna go to Mr. Anthony and get a job at Shake and Bake. And in many ways, because that was Anthony's background, right? Anthony was a kid who was, you know, as he said, he's like, I'm really good with numbers. He's a smart, smart guy. And he was like, you know, my problem was, and, and this, is, this is him, he's like, my problem was I couldn't, you know, kick the alcohol and, and, and the heroin. And this is when he was a teenager, right? And so he ended up being, you know, kind of starting low level, being a punch kid at Shake and Bake and eventually rose to, then he was a general manager. He was in charge of Shake and Bake. But the community loved Mr. Ant. They, they, they loved what he did for the community. They loved the fact that Shake and Bake was a safe haven for them. They love the fact that, that Shake and Bake was a place where no matter what kind of craziness was going on outside, that Shake and Bake was a safe place that you could go inside. Um, they loved how he treated the kids and he loved them and he respected them and he treated yeah. them with respect. And so, um, and so, and it was, it was, a, it was, a, you know, one part, uh, and I don't, I don't want to give too much away, but no, I, mean, well, I, I think about a few moments with, 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 with Mr. Ant that really hit me. One was, um, and actually, well, I, I, I'll, I'll say one, it's not to give away, um, was the day after the uprising. Um, when it was his day off, Tuesday was normally his day off and he woke up that morning uh, and he was watching television and he was seeing what happened in Baltimore the night before because he went to bed relatively early. So he didn't know, he didn't know all that went down Baltimore that night. And uh, he wakes up and he's watching all this news and, um, and, and two things happened that morning that were really powerful. Um, one was a phone call that he got from one of the neighbors, uh, uh, a, a woman, I uh, believe uh, his name was Miss Gloria, and was telling him about what happened the night before when she was like, I gotta tell you, she said, you should be so proud of your boys. She was like, when they were coming down and looting up the stores and all this kind of stuff up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. She was like, your boys came out, locked arms and told the people who were coming down the street, like, this is black owned, yo, move on. This is black owned. And she said, they protected Shake and Bake. Shake and Bake wasn't touched that night. Hmm. And she was saying it was because, she said it was because your boys, the ones who you protected, the ones who no one else would hire, 
the ones who knew they got an opportunity because of you, they literally locked arms in front of Shake and Bake and told everybody, move on. You're not touching this place. And the other thing that was really powerful was that morning when he was watching the television and saw, uh, saw the little girl who was sweeping up the glass and the debris from the, from, the, from the night before. And he was telling me, he's like, she must have been no more than, you know, he's like, that broom was as big as her. <laughs> She's nine years old, 10, whatever, with work gloves, going all the way up to her elbows, <laughs> sweeping. And, and, and the really powerful thing I think about that, which made a really big difference to him was he was like, that was his moment to understand that everybody's got a job to do in terms of the cleanup. Where he's like, listen, I'm not a politician, so I don't give speeches. And he's like, and I'm not rich, so I'm not writing a check. Um, but he said, but I, but I, you know, the thing I do know how to do is I know I got the community and I know how to skate. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll stop there so because people can see exactly how he responded. But it was a really powerful moment for me because it was one of these things where you realize that no one's asked to do everything, but everyone's asked to do something. Everybody's asked to play your role and play your position whatever your position is in these moments. And I think that's in, in, in something that I, I know really resonates with me even right now, right? Where no one's asked to go in and do it all, but everyone is, is being asked to go out there and do something. Right. And go out and use your voice, use your, 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 your power, use your influence, write a check, whatever it is. But everybody needs to do something. And that moment was really powerful for me because I think Ant, um, uh, Mr. Anthony, in, in, in many ways, he really epitomized that in that moment about that it wasn't just about what happened Monday night. The better question was what happens on Tuesday morning? Right. And we now have work to do. Yeah, no, I, I loved his story. And I thought that, um, and again, I thought it was really important as one of eight stories, right? Because I think that there were, and some of the stories you're not going to be able to get to are people who were in politics, people who were activists on the ground during the, um, during the uprising. Yeah. Anthony, I thought, represented someone who had given his life to this community, right? Yes. And the community had given him life. And there was a constant reciprocal bond, right? Like he was someone who was down and out. He got a job at this shake and bake became the general manager, made it a home for other people. Those people in turn saved the shake and bake when you know the neighborhood was on fire. He in turn comes back out, figures out a way to try to help the community coming back. But then all around that time, um, there's still tragedy breaking out, even among the young men that he's you know, working with, there's tragedies yeah. breaking out and death and um, and it shows though, I think this is the beautiful thing about it. It's like, you know, we see what's happening in different parts of the country now, like what's happening in Seattle where they're, you know, have this sort of anarchist commune that's broken out spontaneously. But you see without going even to that point of having an anarchist commune, the ways that we take care of each other outside of the official systems, the way that we are capable of taking care of each other, which does not take the pressure off of the official systems to right. do their part. As you said, everyone has a part, but there's also, I think there's this organic way that we can live not in fear of each other, not in exploitative arrangements with each other, but that we can have this reciprocity. Um, and that's the thing that actually makes a community and that saves the community and saves the individual lives, but can't do it all because we yeah. see what happens even in his group. You know, um, there are tragedies without giving it away. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to stop there and I'm gonna have to turn to some questions because there are some questions. Right. Um, and I think these questions will get us a little bit out of the narrative and into some of the issues. Um, so here's a good question. And I think this is a really good question for you. Um, how do we get upstream from these issues? What should educators and parents do? And I know you've done a lot of work in the educational sector, and I know that you also are a parent um, yourself, but how do we get upstream of these things with our children? Yeah. Um... So first, I, I appreciate that question, and it's hard because, um, you know, I, I think about a, I think a one thing is don't do what I know I did early, which was try to shield it, and this whole idea of if we don't talk about it because they're so young and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I have a, a now as of as of two weeks ago a nine year old, 
as she keeps on reminding me. She's not eight. Uh, it is crazy, right? Because I mean, you, you were there when she was like first born. Man. I know, I know. It's I crazy. Believe. She's like a person. I know, I know. She's a real person, and 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 I'll explain how real of a person she is in a second. Just to be clear, uh, I did not deliver her. <laughs> I was not literally in the room when she was born. But anyway, I'm sorry. That is true. That is true. That is true. But so we, we have kids around the same age, so that's why it's, it always very it, 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 it sits with me. And then we have a uh, have a, a, a six year old son, and you know we're having small conversations, what happened, but not really going into detail what was going on until not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before it, when uh, my daughter um, asked and she said, uh, "So what do I do if a police officer puts his knee on my neck?" Mm. I'm like, damn. Mm -hmm. um, and you realize it's like, you shield or shield them uh, in a way that you think you're helping. But trust me, like they're understanding the world. And so the big question becomes, who are they learning about it from? And I think it was a real important lesson for me where I then had to learn how to be much more deliberate about the conversations that I needed to have with them and the fact that that the world is teaching them every day but there's no one who's going to have a greater influence on the type of instruction that they receive and the content that they should receive than me than my wife right um and so that became something where i knew that that the idea of really being thoughtful and aggressive in this actually matters Right. The other thing that I think was really important in all of this is, and this isn't just for black children, even though I think it's especially important for black children, um, but I think it's actually important for all children, is right now there is this feeling and this idea that we are being constantly told and feel like we have to fight for acknowledgement, right? We have to fight for our place. We have to remind the world that black lives matter. And while that is important, we also have to understand that the reason that we have to do that is because the world continues to tell us that we don't. And so it is, it is, it is, it is part of our larger responsibility. It's part of our larger push. I want my children to know the greatness that they come from. I want them to know their own history. And it's not, it's not just the history of William Wesley Moore and James Joshua Thomas and their own personal lineage, but I want them to know and appreciate the fact that they do come from the blood of Garvey and that they come from the blood of Shabazz and they come from the blood of Parks, and they come from the blood of King, and they come from the blood of Truth, and they come from the blood of Robeson, and they come from the blood of Baldwin. I, I want them to know that. Because also I feel like one of the most powerful things that we can do for our children, and frankly, one of the most powerful things that we can do for all children, is to help them to understand the power of blackness the history of blackness. Why, why that when people are having conversa conversations about equality, that, that we're, not, we're not begging for something. We're, we're, not, we're not scraping to try to get, th this is just a simple acknowledgement of not just our humanity, but the symbol of acknowledgement of our contribution. And so I feel like as educators, um, as parents, as guardians, as human beings, there needs to be that level of honesty and transparency about the contributions that we have made to our large society, that everything we see in this country, trust me, you know, everything that we see in this country, everything, it's black made. It's black made. Right. And so I feel like in this moment where we are watching in living color lives, black lives being snuffed out so easily, at a time when we are having to remind the rest of the world that our lives matter too, 
I also think it's important that we educate not just our children, but educate all children of the fact that it's not just that our lives matter. It's that everything you see, we help build. Right, right. Well, you know what's interesting too is that you know the way the book begins is you're flying away from Baltimore, actually. Yeah. Um, to an event where you're about to be honored, right? Um, yeah. And it's a, an event with you know a bunch of philanthropists and yeah. and people want to honor you because they think your story represents something to be honored, like someone who grew up in Baltimore and in the South Bronx and uh, ended up becoming this big success in so many ways. Yeah. Um, and you felt you had very mixed feelings about being at that event while Baltimore was starting to unravel um, in. It would, you know, the protests were were becoming more chaotic and um, uh, dangerous, and um, and and it makes me wonder. Just going back to that question of like what we do upstream. So you work in philanthropy right now, and you work with a with a with a organization that um, is focused on, on upstream issues. Like, what do we do about childhood poverty? What do we do about education, you know, in a place like New York for the most um, vulnerable and uh, citizens. So is there something that comes out of your work that gives you some ideas, not just your work, like literally like the doling out of, um, of grants and money, but just even in the research work that you all do, like that you've come to understand. And I know that that's a big focus of Robin Hood. Um, is there something there that's given you some way of some new insight into like what the upstream issues are and how we can address them. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, and it's, and I, I wanted to actually start the book uh, in that moment very intentionally, because you're right. right? I mean, I, I started, I started the day going to Freddie's funeral, but right. by the time everything jumped off, I was on my way to Boston right. for an event. Boston. And, <laughs> and it was right, Boston of all places. Um, and it was this, this feeling of complicity that I have, right? It's a feeling of that all of us are complicit in this system that we've created because all of us have a, have a way of whether we understand it, feel it, whatever. It's like we've benefited from it. And, 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 and the complicity of the fact that society is okay with the individual success story, right? Where they can look at you and they can say, look, he made it. And that makes society feel better. Like, like this is really a meritocracy. And the, 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 this dynamic and this feeling that I had was um, that it was a complicity that, that by me accepting that and not challenging that, I was very much part of the problem because you allowed that psychology to exist where this idea that you know we're 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 literally just basing it off of this exclusively off this idea of hard work without understanding that uh that hard work won't matter if you continue to have systems that continue to divide and deconstruct and destroy and so i think about it a lot actually in the world of of philanthropy where you know with our organization you know we're, we're you know I, I run one of the largest philanthropic organizations and, and poverty fighting organizations in the country. And the reality is, if you even think about just the regular aspects of philanthropic giving, I mean, every year, private philanthropic giving every year comes in at, you know, anywhere between six and $800 million a year, right? So let's just call it $700 million a year on average, right? Um, and that seems like a lot of money. People are like, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of cash. Right, and there's a lot of cash. Seven hundred, sorry, not a billion, billion dollars a year, a lot of cash. Um, but here's the reality: half of that goes to colleges and universities, hmm. alma maters. Right, so now that very quickly gets dropped to three fifty. Half of that goes to hospitals and homes of worship. Right, so that's seven hundred is now very quickly dropped down to 175, right? Um, and then all the rest of it is for everything else, for the environment, for veterans issues, for poverty, for seniors, for early childhood education, 
all the rest of it goes towards that smaller amount. And you think about that in context, right? Where how we think about laws and rules and policies, that matters. The fact that the Department of Education, the budget for the Department of Education of New York City alone is around $27 billion a year. You think about the fact that for Baltimore City, the Department of Health, their budget hovers around $40 million a year, right? It's a real number. The budget for the police department in Baltimore City, $509 million. $40 million for health, $509 million for policing. So the larger point is this. It's we have to be honest that two things. One is that budgets are moral documents. How we spend our money tells us about what we care about and what's important to us. The second thing that's important is philanthropy is important. But philanthropy will never be enough to combat bad policies. And so when we're talking about what are the upstream things that we have to focus on, you know, we do have to make sure that as a larger unit that we can partner and create and fund organizations that are, that are really addressing structural issues and they can scale and they can turn in all, I mean, we, we will do all that and use all the data and put together the research and make sure people understand the dynamics that we're talking about. Put together research like we do right now in partnership with Columbia University that shows and highlighted for the nation to understand that over 40% of people before COVID-19 could not afford a $400 shock with cash. And when that came, that shock was there and it was real and it was a lot more than $400. Highlighting the fact that our research showed that literally half of New Yorkers were living in poverty for at least a year over the past four years. Not half of a borough, not half of a group, half of the city were in poverty for at least a year over the past four years. So we have to be able to use our, our capital to be able to present not just research, but fund good organizations and fund things that can scale and move in partnership. And we have, and we will continue to do those things. We also will continue to understand and be humble about the fact that policy matters. Policy matters in our work. And you, if you don't have some form of control or some form of impact or some form of push on how government dollars, public dollars, our dollars are being used to define how our society is structured and how our society is shaped, then we are completely missing the boat. And that's where I think that, uh, you know, some of our largest leverage is that it's not just about our purse, it's about our voice and we plan on using it. Sorry, I think that's a good place for us to, uh, to stop. I think your book, does such a great job of, I think, putting personalities and voices and individual lives to a story like what happened in Baltimore. So I think I felt like at the end of it, I understood it more than I had through any, you know, just following it on the news or a news account. Um, it seemed really, uh, uh, I, I, it felt visceral the way I was able to understand it. At the same time, I think you also in the book, just as you did tonight, left us with a challenge which is how do we then like convert this sort of um, understanding of narrative, you know, the sort of emotional connection to the thing that happened, the thing that's happening right now to the policies, yes. to get the leverage and create the leverage we need to, so it doesn't happen again. And I think, well, again, I'm not gonna give away the end of the book, but at the end of the book, I think we see as we will see, as we're seeing now that there are, um, that there are questions that are left, um, but also opportunities to make it into an inflection point for true change. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's the challenge that we have before us, but I think your book does a great job of setting us up for that challenge with some you know, deep understanding of the events themselves. Um, so thank you very much, Wes, and thank you to everyone who uh, came to I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to all of your questions, um, but it was a really great conversation, Wes. And, uh, the book's called Five Days, and I hope you all can check it out. I do. I appreciate you, Chris. All right. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate right. you. Appreciate night. all y'all. Thank you. Take care.